The treatment of CRSWMP has until recently been fairly straightforward, with clinicians opting to perform surgery of the nose and paranasal sinuses. But advances in medicine now mean that physicians have far more treatment options available to them, and they now have to make a balanced judgment on the relative merits of each of them. They have to take into account the disease process, the pathophysiology, the presenting symptomatology, the pros and cons of each treatment, and of course, the wishes of the patient. There are real challenges in terms of the multitude of factors that have to be accounted for before an individualized treatment plan can be recommended. It is not plain sailing. Now, the question that remains utmost in people's minds is how can we use biologics and surgery to get the best outcomes for patients with CRSWMP? Well, over the next hour, we intend to get answers. Welcome to the Euphoria Innovation Forum debate. Hello, I'm Dr. David Bull, and welcome to this Euphoria Innovation Forum debate on CRSWMP. It is fantastic to have your company. Now, the management of patients with chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, or CRSWMP, has been, well, it's been transformed over the last few years. Thanks to pioneering work over the last two decades, we now know so much more about the disease, and our knowledge of the underlying pathology has also grown exponentially. We can now chart the course of the disease using biomarkers. We have a whole new class of drugs called biologics, which have transformed patient care. And we have far better understanding and awareness of comorbidities that may present. Now, for several years, biologics have been indicated and they are available in a growing number of countries for severe uncontrolled CRS WMP but sadly they are not available in all countries. And that means that surgery or even revision surgery remains the most widely used option in most countries around the world. This debate aims to explore the main therapeutic options available to clinicians and to address one main question. How can we use biologics and surgery to achieve the best outcomes for patients with CRS WNP? Well, to discuss this pressing topic, I am delighted to introduce our panelists. Firstly, our medical experts. From Amsterdam in the Netherlands, Professor Witzke Fokkens. She is Professor of Otorhinolaryngology at the Academic Medical Center. She is also Secretary General of the European Rhinological Society and Chair of the European Position Paper on Rhinosinusitis and Nasal Polyps, or EPOS. From Munich in Germany, Dr. Adam Scharker. He is a specialist in ENT, allergy and the environment at the Klinikum Rex de Isar at the Technical University of Munich. From Norfolk, Virginia in the United States, Professor Joseph Hahn. He is chief of the Division of Rhinology and Endoscopic Sinus and Skull Base Surgery at Eastern Virginia Medical School. From Barcelona in Spain, Professor Joachim Mullol. He is director of the Rhinology Unit and Smell Clinic in the ENT department at the Hospital Clinic. He is also coordinator of the multidisciplinary team Clinical and Experimental Immunoallergy at Idibaps in Barcelona. And joining them are two representatives of the Patient Advisory Board of Euphoria, both from Belgium. They are Natasha Seams and also Daisy Weinberg. A very warm welcome to all of you. Now, we're going to divide our debate into three sections. The first section will be about key considerations for the indication of both revision surgery and biologics, which have revolutionized treatment for patients with CRSWMP, as well as looking at patients' perspectives of each of these therapies. The second section will address the multitude of different factors that healthcare providers can and should discuss with their patients as they determine which therapy or indeed combination of therapies can pose the greatest benefits to patients. And finally, the third section will look at the challenges and the uncertainties in relation to each of these options.
So let's start our debate looking at the key considerations for the various treatment options. Let me start uh, with you, if I can, Dr. Sharka. If you could, uh, for everyone's benefit, talk us through CRSWMP. Tell us the incidence, the symptomatology, and indeed how it presents. It's probably a largely underestimated and somehow heterogeneous disease. So according to autopsy studies, we would estimate around about 4% of an average uh, population to suffer from CRSWNP, but not everyone will report strong symptoms um, that will uh, be present on an everyday basis. The symptomatology that uh, differentiates chronic rhinosinusitis per se with an incidence of around about 10% the European population, is that uh, mainly serious WNP impacts on the sense of smell, which is a bit different, but it also impacts on sleep, on um, concentration and daily, let's say, um, focus in, in your daily work. It uh, further affects um, not only the sense of smell, but also the ability to breathe. Patients will suffer from a blocked nose. And then you have different subtypes, some of which we present with a little bit more, let's like, say, recurrent exacerbations and infections, and others will have other nasal symptoms like um, um, uh, nasal um, um, posterior nasal drip, or a runny nose, or hyperactivity. I think what is also very important to mention is that it's very common that the more severe this disease gets, the more it is associated to comorbidities, and this is depending on the mechanism. Um, the mechanism resembles a little bit of allergic inflammation, but it's not necessary to have allergic sensitization. And these patients often present with comorbid asthma and other type 2 disease. Well, thank you very much indeed. That leads me really nicely, actually, to, to you, Professor Fockens. Now, we know the underlying mechanism is type 2 inflammation. We just heard about certain comorbidities that may exist. Would you like to expand on that? Well, very important that um, many of the severe patients, and we talk about at least 60, 70, 80% of the patients with chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps have asthma. And very often they have late onset severe asthma, which results in declining lung function and eventually in, in very severe lower airway disease. So it's extremely important to recognize uh, that that is not a simple allergic asthma that is uh, benign, but can be very uh, uh, severe and life-threatening. And that that is the uh, combination that we very often see with chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. Well, that's really fascinating. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Fockins. Now, that leads me really nicely, actually, into to patients. Let's, let's come to you, if I can, Daisy, Daisy Weyenberg. If you can remember back, tell us about your symptoms, how you presented, and what happened next, what treatment you got. Uh, well, I've got uh, 10 years ago, I've got two uh, surgeries in six months. And afterwards, it's going uh, very well for a while. But then uh, um, the process re repeats itself with a lot of pain, a lot of medication. Um, and then we restarted uh, a few treatments with uh, different types of medication uh, until we, we found the uh, biologics. And when I found that, um, the improvement came suddenly. Uh, now the, the treatment is uh, stable. But sometimes it, it happened that uh, there is some up or down. Mm. And, and Daisy, just, just let's think back to before when you had the surgery. What were your symptoms? What did you present with? Um, I had a lot of symptoms. I had uh, pain all over my face. I couldn't uh, breathe. There wasn't en enough uh, space in my nose, so so I couldn't breathe uh, well. Um, I didn't smell and I didn't taste anymore. So there was uh, the whole 
13. Fantastic. Let, let me now bring in Natasha, if I can. Let's just talk about your symptoms. How did you present? What symptoms did you have? Um, for me, it all started with a, like a, a normal cold, which got worse and worse and worse. And then um, the family doctor um, told me to go to a specialist. And um, the specialist saw a lot of um, polyps in my nose. And that's when I got my first surgery. Um, then um, it didn't go any better so I had to have a second and a third surgery and um, but as a patient I find it very hard um, because you don't know if the first surgeon has done a good job or a bad job hmm. and maybe he did, he did something wrong the first one and something went wrong I don't know but at first the problems even got worse for me and then after your surgery, you went on to biologics as well, did you? Yeah, but also a lot of different ones. Um, next week, I will be having my fourth different uh, bi uh, biologics. Right. So, so yeah. can I bring in Professor Mullol at this point? I mean, I think really just listening to both of their stories, there are a number of treatment options here, aren't there? What did you make of, of those two stories? Is, is that an, a normal occurrence that people start with surgery, they then tend to get biologics, you might have to change the biologics, people respond differently? Well, actually the, the natural history of the disease usually starts uh, many times uh, such as rhinitis, symptoms in the nose that sometimes are confused with allergic rhinitis and so, and so on. And this is, is evolving in the time. Uh, uh, some treatments are started if the day correct diagnosis has been done. Sometimes the correct diagnostic is not done until several years. And uh, intranasal corticosteroids, short courses of oral steroids, nasal lavages, and so on, are the main treatments at the beginning. Mm. If, the, if the disease becomes uncontrolled, that is what we are talking about, is when uh, surgery uh, becomes the first option to clean up all the, the inflammation that there is in the nose and the, and the sinuses. And uh, when even surgery is not enough, uh, before we had not other possibilities. Uh, we should go from medical treatment to surgery, to medical treatment, to surgery again, and so on. But now we have a, a, a new a, a option of treatment that are the use of biologicals that uh, are uh, uh, added to the, 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 the previous surgery, uh, a very effective a way to treat these patients, or most of these patients. Mm. This is a really good place to bring you in, Joseph, Professor Han. You're in the United States. Is there a, a gold standard in terms of therapy? Is there an algorithm? Is there a recipe that should always be followed? I mean, we're hearing those stories. Do you always start with surgery? Do you add in biologics later? What, what do you do in the States? Yeah, I'm not sure if there is a gold standard, but there is a certain algorithm that most experts who treat nasal polyps, whether in the U.S. or outside the U.S., would kind of agree on. Most people would say that they should undergo um, some medical treatment. Uh, it may be a short burst of steroids, and uh, our, I think our main treatment option is topical steroids. And if the patients fail after this treatment, then most patients should do surgery. Now, how complete the surgery is and how much surgery is done, I think, is kind of dependent. But most people say, depending on the severity of the nasal polyp, if it's really severe, you should open up all the sinus cavities. Once that's done and then, then the polyps come back, then that's where I think there is some divergence and there are treatment options I think we have in the U.S. that may not be available outside the U.S. So we have things like steroid stents or implants that we can put in. Uh, we have different ways of delivering topical steroids. Um, we could use that before 
or even after surgery. And certainly we have biologics. And uh, we're very fortunate to have three biologics. Um, as you heard, um, Daisy and Natasha have. I mean, and you even hear Natasha saying even that she's even going to her fourth one. So there are different biologics that are available and we have more uh, biologics that are being studied. And can I bring you in again, Professor Falkins, just in terms of this, uh, is it really up to the clinician then? We just heard from Joseph, but in terms of using biologics, do we start with, with medicines? Do we then move to surgery? Do you start uh, with steroids? Is it a judgment call? Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Bull. I don't think so. I think most international guidelines advise to use, as uh, Joe already said, intranasal steroids first with rinsing, then try systemic corticosteroids, then try surgery. And if all that fails and the patient has type 2 disease, a severe impact on quality of life, uh, loss of smell, and uh, very often asthma, in those patients, we can decide to go for a biologic. Right. So it's not really up to uh, the clinician, but of course, sometimes uh, patients in, uh, in, in, in the discussion with the um, ENT surgeon decide that they rather want to have another surgery instead of biologics, for example, or vice versa. So it's, um, a shared decision with the patient, but the guidelines are quite clear. Okay, Dr. Shankar, what are your thoughts on that? The guidelines are clear, would you agree? Um, I think we have very good guidelines. Most of them are based on a very long experience, uh, however, from the pre-biologic era. Um, the availability of information for the patients um, has uh, led together with new opportunities in therapy that we have, um, let's say, much more engaged discussions with our patients uh, in the sense of um, shared decision making, as Professor Fockens just has mentioned earlier. Um, I, think, I think the guidelines are, however, a very important um, a map uh, that can orientate you, not only as the treating physician or surgeon, but also as we have lay summaries and patient information available, thank you also to Euphoria, um, that patients actually can say, okay, this is my problem and this is what, what I want to achieve, where I want to go. And if you take the time, it's not so much time actually, to um, define together your therapeutic goals, what is realistic, what are the given um, evidences, is it type 2 disease, have we, have we um, understood what is the pinnacle of the disease, in a, in a way, I mean, we are still limited there, mm. for sure, then, then we can go on and make a more mature treatment decision. And as, as Professor Falkens has already said earlier, there are patients who would prefer surgery and there are other patients who would prefer a biological treatment and there are three that are licensed currently in Europe and the US and um, I think when we look at the studies and also at the real world evidence we see that the error bars are quite large between treatments so it is not that we can really predict what is going to work perfectly but we can advise a little bit more and that's I think the new era since four years available, first biologics um, uh, can be prescribed in label in our indication. And that has changed something. And it did not only change the, let's say, modalities that are available, the options, but it has changed as well that we can be much more ambitious with uh, defining our therapeutic goals, in particular for those patients who suffer most. Mm. And Professor Mullol, just in terms of geography, there are certain countries where you, you simply don't have the biologics or indeed the choice of biologics. So Joseph made the point that in the US they have uh, treatment options that are available to them that we may not have in Europe and certainly not here in the United Kingdom. Yes, you, you are totally right. And actually, uh, recently, last week, one of these uh, biologics was uh, approved for reimbursement in Spain. Probably we'll have the second one in a few months, but we have not had the reimbursement. 
that comes from from the origin that uh, although it is, they are usually very good and very uh, uh, potent drugs against inflammation that is the main cause of the disease the cost is is quite high and it's the, the although it's approved by the EMEA, by the FDA uh, it's each country the ministry of health could decide uh, mainly when the 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 system, the health system is socialized, like it's in Spain, probably, and probably in the UK, uh, who pays? Who, who, who's going to pay the bill? <laughs> and uh, the costs are very high. The treatment of these drugs are very high. And uh, the, usually the demand of biologicals is not only in the area of rhinology. It comes from everywhere, from cancer, from uh, rheumatology, from asthma, from GPA, or whatever. And the number of patients that are being treated with uh, one of these biologicals, sometimes even with two, uh, is very high. And the cost for the social security systems is very high. And, and that is a problem. We have noticed that. We have tried to treat our patients through severe asthma because we had the indication uh, in the same patients. But we had a lot of obstacles, a lot of, of, of stops saying, uh, although these patients would deserve to be treated with biologic, you cannot treat it because it's not going to be reimbursed and the patient should pay by themselves. Mm -hmm. And that is a very problem in a number of countries. Let me just bring in the patients, actually. Natasha, what, what do you think about that? I don't know if you're aware that the treatment options differ depending on which country you're in. And in some countries, as we just heard, you have to pay because it's simply not available. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I do know that um, the medication is very expensive. Um, so, and I do also know that I'm very lucky um, that here in Belgium they pay it back. But on the other hand, um, to get the medication that I'm will be receiving in a few weeks, I had to take steroids for a, a year. So, which I also know that is very bad for my health. So. Yeah. It's not that you get it uh, in a very simple way. Right. And what about, and what, sorry, just moving on to Daisy then. Daisy, what are your thoughts there that different countries have different treatment options? Were you aware of all of this? And, and, and just in terms of the, the differing treatment options that are available to you, and you're also in Belgium. Yes, I knew that uh, there were different options in different countries um, and I'm very glad that in Belgium there is a, a repayment for the medication but not from all of them so here in Belgium there are still some uh, types of medication that you have to pay by yourself but uh, for me there is no other option when I when I need a product I will, I will get it and I will pay for it because I know that it will help me. Mm. Okay, let me just pause you all there. Super, thank you very much indeed. Well, let's now move on to talk about the multiplicity of factors to take into account when looking at the different treatment options. So I think we now have a very good understanding of what CRSWMP is, the underlying inflammatory mechanisms and the differing ways that people can present. And it's clear that clinicians do have a choice of therapy, but it's also clear that there are a multiplicity of factors to take into account before deciding the treatment pathway. Can I just go back to you, Daisy? How much was discussed with you before you started your treatment about the various options? Was it just set given to you? You were told this is what's gonna happen or were you taken through each of those therapies and taught about the upsides and the downsides? No, I was uh, very much involved. Um, I'm gonna tell you this, uh, after my second surgery, um, there was a period that it, uh, the nasal polyp syndrome wasn't good and I went back to the specialist but there went something wrong with the agenda and I was with an assistant. And uh, the lady did what she had to do, she looked at my situation and afterwards she told me, um, yeah, when this is not going to be better, we have to do another surgery. 
But I was so afraid and I was so, uh, there was so much panic in, panic in my head um, that I didn't want to do a third surgery. So I talked to my specialist and we, we find out another treatment to, to avoid the, the third surgery. Okay, so you were very much involved. What about you, Natasha? Um, well, I'm in a better place as four years ago because um, one of my worst problems was coughing all the time. And that was really helped by the biologics. But I do worry sometimes about side effects because I do have some and I'm like um, higher blood pressure. I have heart problems. Um, I suffer from acid reflux, but I don't know if they are a consequence of the medication or not. Okay. Joseph, uh, Professor Han, just in terms of surgery and revision surgery, what do you look for in terms of indications when you, when you move to that treatment option? So you know, when I think about doing revision sinus surgery, there are probably four things I think about. You know, is the medical treatment going to work again? You know, is the initial sinus surgery complete? Uh, the third one is there a complication or an issue from the prior surgery that leads to something that's not going to get better with medicine? And the last one is patient severity. If the patient's symptoms are severe, um, you know, I'll talk to the patient and discuss the shared decision-making process that we discussed earlier. And if the patient is really inclined to doing surgery versus another medical treatment, I'd do surgery again. Right. And um, Professor Fockins, anything to add on that? Would you agree with those, those four things that you consider? I do I absolutely agree. I think it's very important to... Uh, to be sure, especially in revision surgery, what are you going to do differently from the first time? And if you are another surgeon than the first surgeon, then you usually know what to do, what goals you want to achieve. But especially if you do you revise your own surgery, I think it's very important to discuss with the patient, but also to consider yourself. What is exactly I'm going to do differently next time to have a better situation. And if you can't answer that question, if you just redo what you did before, I think that is a very good reason to think twice before you do revision surgery and you might better uh, choose another option. That's a really important point. Let me bring in Wackham now, Professor Mullol. When we move to biologics, what are your considerations before you put a patient on biologics? Well, the, the, the first option that we have in, in a patient with biologic is that uh, we have to have a severe patient uh, that has received the appropriate treatment, either medical and surgical, but remains uncontrolled, no matter of, of, of the treatment. And also, at least it has received one surgery. That is what the guidelines, the consensus agree on that. Then there are several factors, several criteria that Professor uh, Falkins has talked before, some, some of them, uh, but pra practically we have five of them. One is the presence or, or, or the evidence of type 2 inflammation, mainly marketing in blood eosinophilia or, or nasal eosinophil or, or eosinophilia. Uh, also, we have the, the, the need of oral corticosteroids. That is an important burden for, for the patients. Also, an, an important impact on the sense of smell and in quality of life. And finally, comorbidities. Comorbidities that usually need treatment, inhaled treatment. If you have three of these five criteria, we agree in EPOS and EUPREA that there is a proper indication of a biological in a patient that has received at least one surgery, one appropriate surgery. Okay, and Dr. Sharka, would you like to add anything else into that about biologics and, and what you look for? I think one factor is very important, um, and that is systemic di disease. The more systemic the presence of symptoms in the patients are, 
the more likely it is that I will recommend the biologic. So if I have the evidence that my surgery can improve the situation in the patient, and if I have the impression that there is a good correlate that we can target by surgery, then I will also discuss the benefits of surgery. If the patient suffers from several type 2 comorbidities and a strong signs of systemic disease, of systemic inflammation, then I will probably prefer a biological treatment. And um, it is the criteria that uh, Professor Moyol has uh, just, just um, mentioned. And it is this thought that the presence of, for instance, eosinophilia, of total IgE, of comorbid type 2 disease, these are all signs of systemic disease. And this tips the balance. And Daisy, bringing you in here, when, when surgery was talked about, what, what was your view of surgery when, when that was first given to you? When it was first given to me, um, well, the, uh, the consequences I had and I was suffering so much that I, that I, that I agreed with, with the first surgery huh. because I was so hopeful that the problem will be, would be solved afterwards. And what about you, Natasha, in terms of, of that first um, mention of surgery? What were your thoughts? Well, they didn't really give me a choice because uh, the only thing they said was that I had more than 100 polyps on my nose and that they had to be removed to get me better. So the first surgery wasn't really a choice. And so, so then, uh, ju just in terms of moving on then, Natasha, when they finally said to you, right, we're going to start you on biologics, what did you think about that? I'm in a better place than four years ago, and I, I, the only thing that, is, is not, that, that, that hasn't been better is, is the smelling. So I hope with the fourth and last um, medication that will help me. So, so just but, so just in terms when, when they started talking about biologics to you, you went away. Yeah. You read the side effects and everything. Were you frightened before you started using biologics? Yes, I was. Interesting. Yeah. What about you, Daisy? I was more afraid when they told me they had to do a, a, a second surgery. Right. So that frightened you more than than the idea yeah, of biologics. I'm sure. Yeah, indeed. Okay, can, can I just sort of wrap this up, at this part up, actually, coming back to you, Joachim, to Professor Mullol. In terms of biologics, in your view, what sort of patients tend to benefit the most and who benefits the least? Well, uh, this is quite biased by the kind of patients that we have to, to treat. I mean, you have to understand, and, and, and sometimes we are in the position that we can only treat severe uh, uncontrolled patients because the indication we cannot administer these drugs to early stages or to moderate stages that potentially could be uh, or have more efficacy. We we have to give to these patients. I mean, the, the, as I think, like for Dr. Falklands and Dr. Shaker has said before, I mean, when there is a, 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 a big amount of, of severity around about the size of polyposis, about the, the inflammation in the blood or in the nose, the association with comorbidities, the burden, and the burden of the disease is the, the massive use of oral steroids, not the intranasal steroids, that are, these are quite safe and they should be used in all the steps of the treatment, but oral steroids create an important burden and repetitive uh, uh, in, uh, surgeries. When all of this uh, uh, joins in a mixture, usually in a lot of patients, is the moment that if you have the possibility of, of, of give these drugs because they are reimbursed, to have an indication of biologics for, for these patients. Uh, and Witzka, Professor Fockins, I, it was just really fascinating listening to Daisy and Natasha about their feelings about surgery and worry about surgery and indeed worry about biologics, the side effects of this. I often think that maybe sometimes clinicians don't take into account how the patients feel, their, their, their trepidation about what they're about to go through. Yes, I agree. That's, that's uh, a big issue. Um, we know that what we say in the outpatient clinic to a patient, that 
90% uh, will not be remembered because your your tense and patient is so I really always like my patients to record what I tell them uh, and also very good to have someone with you if you go to a consultation to hear what is actually said. I think it's really important to emphasize that biologics are as far as we now know and for some of these biologics we have 20 years of experience are very safe treatments. They do not lead to hypertension. They do not lead to heart disease. They do not lead to cancer. So um, I think that's very important to emphasize to patients that, of course, it's relatively new treatment, uh, that some are on the market now for five, four or five years, uh, and we, we can't um, predict anything, but that there until now is absolutely no indication that these biologics have severe side effects. For surgery, we know that the more, uh, the more often a, a revision uh, is performed, the dangers of the surgery increase. And that's something we have to discuss with our patients. Mm. If there is more scar tissue, if there has been a number of earlier surgeries, surgery becomes more uh, dangerous. And it's always important that if you do a revision of a revision of a revision, that that is done by very experienced surgeons who know what to do in a situation like that. And Dr. Sharka, Adam, Anything that you'd like to add to what Witzke, Professor Fockins has just said? I can fully confirm um, that it is very difficult for the patients to um, um, basically get everything from one consultation. Um, for sure, there are very different psychological profiles in our patients, but one is very common when you work in a tertiary referral center or university hospital, that patients have underwent several treatments and they are not happy with the result in chronic diseases. Um, in particular, right now we are speaking about chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. And that is actually what um, has changed a little bit in the last four years, that patients, they inform themselves, they read, they read also for sure about potential side effects. And, and the consultation um, that I have observed in the last years, they, they have changed in a way that there is more dialogue about, about the available options. But for sure, it is difficult because this is our daily business. We do that 20 times a day. And our patients hear it perhaps for the first or second time in their life. And, and it's difficult for them also to emotionally um, um, handle and cope with the situation. Mm. So um, I, think, I think it is very important that, that you give the opportunity to come back perhaps for a second consultation. That is not always possible. And for sure, we have to also to treat all the numbers of patients that, that are on the waiting list. I mean, we are perhaps more comfortable with this. In Germany, we don't have usually waiting lists, not yet. Mm. Um, but, but in a way, um, I see this kind of tension. I think with regards to the safety profile, Professor Fockens Witzke made a fantastic and important point. By now, the real-world evidence data and also the clinical studies from the last 20 years for omalizumab, for the last, let's say, eight to nine years for dupilumab and eight years for mepolizumab and for other biologics as well, like benralizumab that are not used in our field, um, so they have been explored. And the upcoming new biologics like tezibelumab, they have really good safety profiles. They may have differences among the different antibodies, but overall, if you think about the efficacy of these treatments, they are remarkably safe and it's 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 really um fundamental breakthrough for our patients not for everyone and there is still a lot of patients who are going to benefit from surgery but i think we can today with much more credibility advise our patients which treatment they have to choose mm. or such, may choose such such strong points from all of you thank you very much indeed let me just pause you for a moment so 
I mean, clearly what's transpired from that conversation is, is clearly it's a complicated picture. There are lots of factors that we need to take into account before we decide on a treatment pathway. Well, let's turn now to the challenges and the uncertainties that the various treatment options throw up. Let me come back to you, Adam, to Dr. Ashaka. J just outline for everyone watching this what you believe are the benefit, the risks, uh, and the limitations of revision surgery. So the clear advantages are that you, if you have a clear disease correlate, that you can access directly um, the tissue, for instance, in the paranasal sinuses in the frontal, using powered and navigated uh, instrumentation. And you can uh, use this kind of treatment as an immunoablative um, procedure, meaning that you reduce the amount of inflammatory um, uh, inflama inflamed tissue in, in the nose, directly where the situation occurs. Um, this means also for the um, time after the surgery that you have, when things heal off, the potential of um, disease modification, though we all know that in those patients where we had already one surgery, this kind of approach may be too optimistic. The potential risks that can occur are also very familiar for us. The eyes and also the skull base are very near, so the responsible surgeons and experienced surgeons will either use navigation or will have extensive um, experience with the anatomical uh, landmarks and situations there that can be sometimes jeopardized by previous surgery as well. And the limitations, let me be very clear, the more often you have done revision surgery, the less likely it is that you really are going to change things for long term. In particular, if you aim for disease modification using approaches like reboot surgery, you should be really, really humble with your, with your own um, estimates with, when it comes to your own t uh, surgical skills. On the other hand, what you have at stake is, is that the patient may need much less systemic treatment for a considerable time um, and may have very easy access to the paranasal sinuses. So I think revision surgery has a lot of chances, but you have to choose the right patients. And Professor Han, is there anything you would like to add to that incredibly comprehensive answer about revision surgery? Yeah, I think uh, Professor Shaka did a really good job kind of explaining it, but I'd like to add a couple of points. So, you know, when he said that the benefit of sinus surgery is kind of decreasing the inflammation, in a way you're resetting the inflammation, you're getting rid of it all so that you can allow better treatment uh, better efficacy of the medical treatment. And uh, and one of the limitations that I think a lot of people or a lot of misunderstanding is that they don't think that nasal polyp is a chronic disease. It's a chronic disease, so just like diabetes, just like hypertension. So, you know, a lot of people think that by doing surgery, you get cured of the nasal polyp, but that's not true. S surgery is just one big step in trying to decrease the inflammation so that the medicine can work but you still need to be on medicine. So, you know, revision sinus surgery never cures nasal polyp. It's just one big step in allowing the medical treatment to work much better. Okay, and Professor Fockins, let's, let's do the same if we can with biologics. For you, outline for everyone watching this, the benefits, the risks, and indeed the limitations of biologics themselves. Of course, biologics only work if there is type two inflammation. So not all polyps have type 2 inflammation. In the, in the US, in Europe, most severe patients have type 2 inflammation, but definitely not all. In Asia, for example, it's about half. So type 2 inflammation is a prerequisite to have a biological working. Um, so that's one important thing. Uh, Another important thing is that not all biologics are the same. Some bi biologics work better in some patients than others. Some biologics work better in certain diseases. 
than others. We have patients with severe asthma where the biologic works very well for the asthma, not so well for uh, the uh, chronic bronchial sinusitis with nasal polyps and vice versa. So that is something we still have to learn. And we are in a, in a learning period um, of a, a limited number of years now to really understand which biologic is perfect for a certain patient. And we heard that already from our patients and uh, saying, I, I now start to have my fourth biologic. Of course, that's not what we want. We want to directly have the proper treatment for that specific patient. But now it's still very often a matter of trial and error. Uh, and, and um, oh, sorry to, to interject, but Wakim, um, you spoke about biologics as well earlier on. Any views there about um, the, the limitations, the risks, the involvement uh, when you start patients on biologics? Well, the main limitation, I think, following what we has said, is that we try to, to treat patients in a new way, uh, with different biologics that target uh, different targets, different inflammatory targets. What, but we don't know yet which kind of patient should be treated in each of, in each, uh, uh, of the, with these uh, different uh, targets. That is when we have the, 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 the magical uh, word or the holy grail, huh. that is the biomarker. We are, we are using bio, we are in trying to use and learning and studying new uh, uh, biomarkers. We have, for example, eosinophilia in the nose or in the, when the, when the blood, that uh, is a marker of mainly severity and global inflammation, general systemic inflammation. But we don't have good markers that predict the success of treatment. This is the holy grail at this moment, to find markers, even in tissue, even in, in blood, that will predict that this specific drug will be uh, or will have the maximum efficacy in this group of patients. And although we mark a, a guideline as a highway where uh, most of the knowledge goes straight ahead, we have to individualize. That is where we are going for personalized medicine, looking to biomarkers that uh, help us to learn and to show the patient what is the best treatment for them. So Wacom, just staying with you, just in terms of when you start, you talk about biomarkers and so on, but just in terms of the biologics, how much uncertainty is there in your own head, in, in, indeed in your clinical practice, when you start someone on a biologic, how much, uh, what are the parameters of uncertainty in the way that they are likely or unlikely to respond? Actually, uh, there is a, a, a big uncertainty. I, I mean, uh, we decide to give one drug or, or the other depending on some issues. For example, if there is a lot of eosinophils, uh, the, the, the disease is very eosinophilic, more than 1,000 and so on, maybe we will go directly to give a drug that is anti-eosinophilic. Uh, and we will prevent maybe of giving other drugs that could increase the eosinophil instead of downregulate them. I mean, I think that still uh, we need a lot of research to be done to make a clear definition or a clear indication of which antibiotic, uh, which biologic should go uh, in a specific patients. In asthma is different because at least they have the allergic asthma and they have one specific drug that is anti-IgE, anti-allergic, but this is not the case of, uh, uh, well, this is not demonstrated, the case of chronic sinusitis without, with nasal polyps. And, and Adam, uh, Dr. Shaka, just, just for you, that level of uncertainty when you use biologics, anything that you'd like to add about those parameters? If you've asked me two years ago, I would have been optimistic. Um, to be, to be very fair, my personal impression is that there is a reason why we have these broad error bars in the clinical studies. And uh, though we do our best for endophenotyping our patients as good as we can with the markers we have available, we may have not fully understood 
are those patients who will show optimal response for the different three different drugs available at present. Um, I think what is very clear, and this is something we have learned also from EPOS 2020, is we should not go for non-type 2 disease. And this is very important. So if we don't have any evidence of type 2 disease, we should not, we should not switch off our brains and just do it. We should, mm -hmm. we should be careful because we, we reduce the risk, uh, we reduce the um, likelihood that we will have um, a success. And in all the other cases, I would follow the uh, lead of Professor Moyol with regards to eosinophilia, but also for total IgE. But it's, it's not very clear. It is not very clear yet. Okay. And Professor Fockins, just coming back to surgery, what level of uncertainty do you have before you operate? Well, the first surgery is, is quite clear. We want to remove as much as possible of the inflammatory tissue and open up the sinuses for local medical treatment. So that's relatively easy. If you have to revise, then the question is, what are you going to do different this time? Is it just removing the polyps because they have grown back and you want to open up the sinuses again? Do you want to be more extensive in your surgery? But as um, Professor Hahn already uh, uh, emphasized, it is an inflammatory disease. Surgery is never going to cure the disease. Surgery is just making a, uh, a new start and the medical treatment, the anti-inflammatory treatment has to keep the chronic disease under control. So the main uncertainty of surgery is, are you able to create a situation where the anti-inflammatory treatment can keep the disease under control? Uh, and if that's not the case, then um, the symptoms will come back. Um, and just uh, in terms of that, Joseph, uh, Witzke just mentioned you there. Anything that you'd like to add to what she's just said? Yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, for me, when I do surgery, you know, what I'm uncertain is how quickly the polyps are going to come back. And it's hard to determine, you know, I mean, I think you have a general understanding by looking at certain lab results, uh, but it's unclear, even if you do a perfect sinus surgery, it's unclear how quickly the polyps are going to come back. So there is a little bit of uncertainty for that. The other thing is, even if you also do a really great surgery, sometimes you're not sure how things will heal because there are certain patients that make a lot of scar tissue and you know there are specific diseases that have nasal polyps um, that after a good sinus surgery it may look good for a couple of weeks but after time you can develop extensive scar tissue and and have problems so those are certain uncertainties that you can't predict even though you do the surgery well and Natasha, can I just come back to you as a patient? How much of this was explained to you about the risks, the benefits, the limitations of these various treatments? Well, to be honest, um, the first doctor didn't give any explanation. I was one of those patients that went to surgery and thought that um, I was going to be cured and that um, that surgery would be the end of all my problems, and that was not the case. And, and what? So, about, and, and just moving on to the biologics, how much of that was explained about the limitations, the risks, the possible benefits, and so on? Uh, a lot more, a lot more. But well, um, nobody can tell if it's going to work. It's all. Every doctor says, "Yeah, well, we're going to try this, and we're going to try that," and. Well, you don't know. No, quite. And Daisy, for you, how much, rather like Natasha said, initially she wasn't really told very much at all. What, what for you was your experience? Was it explained to you these are the certain risks, these are the benefits or possible benefits, these are the limitations, this might be possible, this might not? Well, uh, with the first surgery, I wasn't told either, but uh, at, at uh, the second time, um, they told me more, and then I was uh, uh, more prepared. 
uh, I was still afraid, but uh, I knew it 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 would uh, it must uh, be there the operation. Um, but there, there was uh, after this, the second operation, there was there was again hope that uh, I was cured. But afterwards, um, that wasn't the case, and then I was uh, a bit depressed. Uh, but the biologic um, was more helpful, and then I knew that um, there was a, um, a part that. Um, yeah, it, it's, it was not sure that, that uh, the biologics would help, mm. but in my case, it, it helped me. But, but how much did they explain about the biologics before you started them? Um, it was well explained. Good. Yes. Excellent. Let me pause you there. Thank you very much indeed to our entire panel for those very insightful comments. Well, let's draw this to a close now. Very quickly, I really do want to get your final thoughts. Let's start with you, Daisy. What else can you add here based on your own experiences and indeed talking to other patients as well? What do you want people at home to, to know and to understand? Um, that they have to keep the courage to uh, try the different treatments. It's not because you because the first treatment doesn't uh, uh, doesn't help that the other ones won't help uh, maybe it takes a while but you have to go on and you have to try and again and again and again and natasha what would you like everyone at home to understand having gone through the journey that you've told us about wh what are your thoughts um, I agree with Daisy that it's uh, a long road before you get there um, and as a tip I would um, say to other patients ask as much as you can to doctors because sometimes they forget to tell you things. And that is a, a brilliant point. Ask as many questions as you possibly can. Let's now come to the clinicians. I mean, clearly, I think all of you have painted such a brilliant picture, a complicated picture. We talked about the individualistic approach that is needed. We talked about the geography, the drugs that may or may not uh, be available. Joseph, Professor Han, your thoughts, having uh, had this, this very eloquent conversation, how would you summarize what we've been saying? So, you know, what I've heard from Natasha and Daisy is that we as provider, as much as we know, we need to be able to convey a lot of the different, you know, the risk, benefits and limitations of the different treatment options that we provide to the patient. And I think, you know, maybe sometimes we're not doing as good of a job. And even with a limited time, we need to be able to find a way to convey that information better to the patients. And Professor Malol, your, your final thoughts. They should know what are the stages of the disease, which treatment can solve a stage to a stage, and they should know the potential efficacy of drugs that are given or the treatments, if it is surgery, the potential risk, the limitations, everything that we have discussed. But if I have to summarize, the most important thing that sometimes is lacking a lot is education and information. Very well said indeed. Uh, Dr. Shark, your thoughts? I think this was extremely educative also for me this evening, in particular because we have also the patient's perspective, not only from, from the surgeons and physicians. Um, what I have learned and what I think is a priority is, as Professor Moyol has stated earlier, communication and not only between patients and doctor, but maybe also between treating doctors as well. A second one is we have to face it, the resources are not unlimited. And this is a, let's say, um, call to action that we need to do more research to better understand with which treatment we can help which patients best. Mm, very, very wise thoughts indeed. And finally, if I may come to you, Witzke, Professor Falkins, 
your your thoughts, your concluding thoughts after after what I think has been a, a very thorough conversation about where we are, the limitations of treatment, the benefits of treatment, and, and the role of the patient. What I learned in this hour, and what I think is extremely important, is that for shared decision making between patient and physician, both need all the information available. And it's the task of the physician to be totally up to date, to be critical of what they can achieve and what they cannot achieve, to be honest to the patient, what can be done and what cannot be done in a chronic disease that will last for a very long time. And for the patient, it's so important to have reliable information and to really understand that information and in the discussion, in the uh, outpatient clinic, we have to talk again and again. And if one discussion is not enough, we do it again. And if needed a third time or a fourth time until the patient is really the one who can take a, um, a learned decision. And uh, I, I think that we need to do whatever we can to help our patients to become more knowledgeable and to manage themselves with our help. Extremely wise words. Thank you to all of you. Now, just before we leave you, I do want to point out that there is a very valuable resource available to you. It's the Euphoria Chronic Rhinosinusitis Pocket Guide and Treatment Algorithm, which includes options for both revision surgery as well as biologics. Now, Euphoria also published an update this year on the practical guidelines for patients on biologic treatment, including criteria for the selection of patients who would benefit from biologics. It's incredibly helpful, it's very informative, and you can download it from the Euphoria website. You can also scan the QR code, which is on your screen now. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for. It really has been a brilliant, thought-provoking debate. And many thanks indeed to all my guests for taking part, to Daisy Weinberg, to Natasha Seams, to Professor Joseph Han, Professor Wakim Mullol, Dr. Adam Sharka, and of course, Professor Witzke Falkins. And thank you very much indeed to all of you for watching this Euphoria Innovation Forum debate on how we use biologics and surgery to optimize outcomes for patients. I hope you found it extremely useful, informative and provocative. And I hope what you've learned today or indeed what's been reinforced in your own minds today will be reflected in your own clinical practices. Now you can find more information about Euphoria and register for the Euphoria Meetings and eAcademy, the online learning portal, all available on the euphoria.eu website. You can also sign up to receive the latest news via email and don't forget to follow us on all socials for all the latest news and information. But for the moment, from all of us here, thank you for watching and goodbye. Thank you very much.